within my 10 minute presentation, I have cherry picked just three aspects. In the first, I cover the foundation and background of craft policy. In the second, I reflect on other perspectives. While my concluding remarks are on transitions and policy refractions. So to the first, the hard reality faced by the newly independent Republic in 1947 was a stagnant and deindustrialized economy. Committed to the nationalistic em emphasis on self-reliance, policymakers predicated its regeneration on the basis of five-year plans, assessing and prioritizing development needs and accordingly allocating capital outlays. The on-the-ground situation of the craft sector was described in 1951 in the first plan, and I quote, as one that has been decaying and the rural population, which constitutes about 83% of the total, suffers from chronic underemployment and low incomes. Quote, unquote, closed. In parallel, the policy direction left no room for ambiguity. And I quote again, for the revival of village industries, these crafts which have suffered much will deserve special attention. The plan focused on eight developmental aspects, sectoral reorganization, credit availability, access to raw materials, tools and equipment, technical guidance, skill enhancement, welfare, sales and marketing, and an emphasis on research, all set under the umbrella of a protective fiscal and regulatory policy. Policy makers squarely recognized that the craft sector represented not only an invaluable cultural tradition, but equally an economic force impacting development and GDP. Plan documents continue to reiterate this rule, and I quote, the sector is not to be viewed as a static part of the economy, but rather as a progressive and efficient decentralized sector, which is closely integrated on the one hand with agriculture and on the other with large scale industry. With adjustments and modifications, the eight core developmental aspects remained central to craft policy over the decades. But beyond this thrust, there were also special instruments, projects that were out of the usual policy remit. Some were never replicated, like the establishment of the Craft Museum in Delhi in 1972 and the 1980s decade-long Festival of India and its concomitant development activities while others were absorbed within the system to be exponentially amplified. Like the founding of design institutes, which now crisscross the country with the NIDs and 18 NIFTs forever changing the landscape of design for crafts. The establishment of Dilihat in 1984, a permanent space for craft performances and cuisine now replicated and multiplied. And though decadal handloom censuses have been con conducted, what continues to baffle is a lack of a census on the number of craft practitioners, the numbers varying from the official 7 million to 200 million. However, I now turn back to the plans and the 1990s, a period when the Indian economy was faced by huge fiscal and budgetary deficits a foreign exchange crisis, and a host of other challenges. In response, national priorities were overhauled, structural changes enacted, from liberalized market reforms to the opening up of the economy, all reflected in plan documents from the 1992 onwards. Policy now advantaged an urban orientation and industrialization over the rural and the handmade while continuing to be acknowledged for its cultural underpinnings and its huge employment potential, the process of declining budgetary allocations for the crafts had commenced. And by the start of the 21st century, the craft sector had been relegated to policy backwaters. 
these shifted goalposts were echoed in its financial allocations in national accounts. The second part of my talk is a sidestep to provide another perspective on this complex landscape. For while the primary administration of craft linking policy intent to its implementation and outcomes is under the aegis of the Ministry of Textiles, policies impacting craft have not been ring-fenced or contained within its administration, but have a far more widespread tapestry. At my last count, there are at least 15 central ministries that influence the policy craftscape through law, fiscal measures, statutes, regulations, international conventions, or through programs. These ministries include external affairs, culture, commerce and industry, minority affairs, MSME, to tourism, environment, and others. And just some of the influential policy impacts include the 1999 Geographic Indication Act, a CUI generous trade-related intellectual property law, with the mandate that includes rights for place-based crafts with now over 60% of the GIs being granted in this area. Obligations as signatories to international conventions, including the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals, where craft tick 11 of the 17 goals directly or indirectly. The UNESCO 2000 Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, which has recognized the Tateras of Jandiala Guru as a heritage of humanity, as are the craft practices associated with the 13 additional Indian nominations. Jaipur's inclusion as a city of craft in UNESCO's Creative Cities Network. The levy of GST on crafts and handlooms and its implications. And the new Companies Act 2013, with its provision for corporate social responsibility, mandated to a 2% net profit spend in every fiscal year, bringing in the big players and a new scale of operation in the crafts. All these and more, multiplications and singularities have impacted the policy la landscape, often beyond their prescription with far reaching consequences. But to the here and now, and to my concluding remarks, for we are seemingly at a refraction point, as just in the last 20 days, there have been pronouncements that presage a changing future for crafts policy. I first draw on three relevant points arising from the G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration of 10th September. The impact of these lie in the small print as the very definition of the cultural and creative sectors and industries has been widened to include community-based craft, handloom, and other arts as one of the 12 declared categories. The first statement I bring to your notice is an acknowledgement of the economic significance and societal value of the cultural and creative industries. The next statement is on leveraging and adopting digital technologies and frameworks for the protection, promotion, and development of cultural and creative industries. And the third statement is focused on intellectual property protection of living heritage with regard to the impact of its over-commercialization and misappropriation. The rollout of action on these declarations is still awaited. The second big announcement on 17 September was the PM Vishwakarma scheme with a budget of rupees 13,000 crores, a spend across 18 trades, of which 13 are craft categories. Interesting, the scheme has been housed under micro, small, and medium enterprises, one of the ministries on the list of 15 I had mentioned earlier. This ministry is not new to crafts as it already administers the activities of Khadi, its spinning, weaving, and marketing, and of the village industries. While it's too early to foretell these policy futures, many, including myself, will be tracking developments. 
I conclude now on a personal note. As my experience has been that governments are not impervious or impervious to suggestion. And those working in the craft ecology can impact policy, ensuring that it keeps in step with expectations or when out of step with the interests of the community it is meant to serve, it can work towards influencing a course cor correction. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ritu, for that fantastic um, introduction, not only to the foundation of craft in India, but bringing it right up to the moment uh, in terms of craft policy in India. We've seen tremendous shifts in the policies and from craft being central to the policy of the first five-year plan in 1951 to what we see today. Um, it's, it, I look forward to the discussion with the panelists today. Um, I'm deeply honored to moderate this discussion. We have as our panelists, those I regard as the giants in the world of craft in India today, giants whose shoulders we stand on, certainly my generation. And while I could talk to you forever, I'm keeping in mind the limited time that we have this morning. Um, and to narrow down the conversation, I thought that firstly, let me define craft for this evening for the purpose of our conversation. Can you hear me, Leila? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, while the development commissioner says handicraft is about processing materials by hand with hand tools, we all know that it's much more complex than that. And I'd like to consider that we're talking about an artisan economy within the larger context of the creative economy for culture, the arts, and heritage, as Ritu outlined. And as I begin, I just wanted to propose that we look at craft for the purpose of this conversation in the rural context, as best expressed um, in, in a spectrum that I think we began to sort of use at uh, Suma Kalavidya and Kalaraksha earlier than that, where you define craft from Kalakari, that craft that is artistry, that is perhaps one of, <clears throat> to Karigiri, craft as skill, to Majuri, craft as labor. And it's on this scale that you've got the extremes of the one, one of a kind to the mass produced. Um, I'd... Uh, also like to just outline this evening's conversations. So I'd love to be able to learn briefly about how policies and ecosystems have enabled your work and the work that you represent, and then shift our focus quite quickly to the contemporary, to the rapidly changing landscape, and to look at the future and the unaddressed needs or how we could have our policies really reaching that last smile of the artisans. Um, so Gita, my first question is to you. You are the chairperson of the oldest organization in India for craft advocacy, the Crafts Council of India, which exists in nine states. And it has a direct lineage to the wonderful foundation that Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay gave the craft movement. It was founded in 1964 in partnership with the government of India. I want to ask you in brief, what role does the craft council play in the, in the shaping of policies for the craft sector? And if you could give us some examples of these contributions. Uh, when the eighth five-year plan was being worked on, we were invited, a lot of us were invited to sit uh, and set several small discussion groups to work out what we wanted in the next five years. 
So all our uh, ideas were taken into consideration. A lot of them were probably put to use, but um, I think we lost it after that. Uh, we have not been consulted on policy matters at all. So we just needed to go on with what we thought was important for the sector. And of course, what we think is important is for crafts to continue, mm -hmm. for the artisan to be able to sustain his livelihood through crafts. And hopefully that the next generation would follow suit. Mm -hmm. That may not happen, but it is up to us to ensure that they earn a proper livelihood. And how do we do this? By, by making sure that they have the marketing links, help them with that marketing, help them with quality, help them with upgradation of their tools, anything that will help them sell more to widen their markets. So that's our primary concern of enhanced livelihoods. Thank you. And the Kamala stores certainly represent this beautifully for those of you who haven't been to the Kamala stores, particularly in Delhi and Chennai and Calcutta, you can really see an example of what Geeta talked about, about marketing quality and the very best. My next question is to you, Jaji. Um, what did it take to establish the Lihat? Um, it it uh, was established in the early 1990s an enormous project in scope. Um, you know, it includes cuisine and craft and culture from all of the states and an incredible geographic si uh, size working uh, with the Delhi Tourism Government uh, Department, the Government of Delhi, the Ministry of Textiles and the Ministry of Tourism. But an incredible feat, uh, Jayaji. And tell us what specific governmental policies enabled this venture so many years ago. And what are the policies that help it to survive today? Thank you, Radhi. Well, it's such a long saga that took actually six or more years to come into being. And that was because there's actually no policy before that for any such idea. Hmm. And uh, when I went first to various officials, starting at the bottom, managers, general managers of Delhi Tourism, to managing directors, then to various officials in the state government of Delhi, and they kept saying, show what would be your growth figures. I said, I have no idea. Let's not always have something which is part of a copied formula. This is something where you're giving an opportunity. And especially in 1990, 91, when we were opening up global markets, I thought that my most powerful argument was if you're opening up markets for Pepsi and potato chips, we need to open up urban markets for our rural producers because they should not stay in the pavements all their lives. So that's how the first idea came across. But eventually, it was my involvement with politics that I was able, climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder, and finally going to the prime minister then, Mr. V.P. Singh, and saying that at that, that time there was a militancy in Kashmir was at its height. There were huge floods in Andhra. So all these, um, the Kashmiris were being given bazaars all over the country. So I said, why do we set up these uh, tents and have contractors every time who benefit more out of it than the craftsman actually does, have a permanent place for impermanent people? So that has been my uh, framework for the Lehat. And changing it, rotating every two weeks was a lovely idea, which gave a chance to everybody and worked very well for 10 years. Of course, I keep also saying, and I have to add here, that every store, good story has a bad side. And that is that here, um, success was the cause for greed. And greed became something that the traders were, have taken over slowly. And Delhi Tourism today is getting an income from it. Crafts people, all sorts of people get various kinds of income below and above the table. So it's not quite as it should be. But the concept certainly was multiplied all over the country and 
uh, there were corporates and others who did studies which I had no knowledge of, which said it was the best form of marketing for crafts. So as an idea, it was something that was just snatched out of the air by me, having seen many village hearts across the country. And I thought that was the perfect socioeconomic cultural engagement between people. And why could we not replicate that to counter the malls and super bazaars that were coming up? So that was, uh, in short, the idea. And some of it is still okay, some not. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing with us in such a transparent way the successes and the challenges that remain uh, 40 years later. But um, for those who are listening, the Lee Heart is a very special place, um, not just for meeting artisans, for, but for experiencing um, the culture of each of the regions that the artisan represents. Um, Leila, in 1981, you founded Dastakar, and uh, from Dastakar came Nature Bazaar, uh, both of which are NGOs, and uh, together they impact and they support 600 craft groups across 29 Indian states. Um, the width and the depth of those, of, of, of just that um, uh, um, enterprise that you've taken on is, is mind boggling to me, um, trying to just manage one exhibition at a time at Artisans. But I want to ask you about the early days. How was Dastakar supported in its early days? Years. Well, as you say, it all began in 1981 when a group of us, and I must emphasize that Daskar is not my single handed task. There were five of us who got together. Uh, and it was a very, um, it was completely voluntary. Uh, we didn't really look ahead to see where it could go and how it would go. But we all felt, all five of us who came from very different professions and uh, backgrounds, felt that we had this extraordinary wealth of craftspeople with living skills in the country, but they were getting more and more marginalized and forgotten, mainly because they were rural-based. They had no contact with their urban consumers, mm -hmm. and the urban customers also had no idea of this wealth of materials, of skills, of techniques, of designs and motives. And we felt that if we could act as a bridge between these two, something could happen. And we started doing it first very informally uh, on a part-time basis. We were all working. And because it was the 1980s and we were very um, idealistic and perhaps a little naive, we felt strongly that we should not take funding from anybody until we proved that the idea worked. So um, nowadays, everyone thinks that NGOs are created to make money, but we were not of that ilk. Uh, but because we were one of the very first organizations who were talking about craft as a sector rather than individual projects, uh, quite a lot of people were interested in this. And um, Julian Francis, who was the country director of Oxfam was particularly uh, excited by this idea that craftspeople should have both advocates as well as mentors and partners <clears throat> in an urban situation who could guide them about markets, about potential products, how to adapt their skills to the kind of needs of a new sort of, new sort of range of buyers. So he sort of said that well, uh, I'm ready to fund you as soon as you're ready. So I think it was about a year and a half before we actually got our thoughts together and put uh, wrote up a proposal. And in the meantime, we had already met the DC handicrafts, uh, Mr. Shirumani Sharma, who was a really very enlightened person who was passionate about the creative industries. And he gave us access to what had hitherto 
been a totally government scheme. I mean, meant only for government departments, which was the marketing scheme. And we did our first bazaar in, I think, uh, the sort of spring of 1982 at the Triveni Kala Sangam with 15 craftspeople. And it seems extraordinary now when craft bazaars and exhibitions proliferate all over India, that it was quite a novelty for craftspeople themselves to come for the first time to a city and to sell directly rather than through a government department or a middleman. And uh, they were quite nervous. Today, they travel with great confidence all over India. But in mm -hmm. those days, we had to go to the railway station with a big placard and sort of in, uh, take them and we had them stay with us and we had to organize their food. So that was the beginning of Daskar, and I'm glad to say it's grown. And um, we now, as you say, work all over India. But after receiving funding from Oxfam, from ECO, from, De uh, from the Government of India schemes, we now are sort of back to the thing where we are self-sustainable. We don't actually take funding except for very specific projects. And we are able to support ourselves both through the per a percentage of sales which the craftspeople people give us, as well as the consultancies that we do for uh, other buyers, international and domestic. That's incredible. That's incredible. It's also quite a logistical challenge, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, that's why my hair is completely white, Radhi. <laughs> But um, and then you didn't mention Nature Bazaar, but was that to do with the whole trend for green? And is it a well? Actually, it was. Green? It grew from the fact that we were doing these bazaars uh, in Delhi twice or thrice a year, as well as in other metro cities, Bangalore, Pune, Bombay, where we haven't been for some time, Chennai, mm -hmm. etc. And, uh, you know, craftspeople uh, seem, uh, obviously Delhi was a very good market because it's so multi-layered. It has everything from diplomats and tourists to international buyers, to students, to corporates, everything. And uh, there was this constant uh, request from craftspeople that we should do something a little more permanent. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think by that time, the Lihat, as I was saying, had begun to not quite be a place for authentic small craftspeople. And so it is a uh, public-private uh, thing with the Delhi tourism mm -hmm. and the Delhi government. And we actually pay them 22% of whatever we revenue we raise. Uh, including the tickets, the entrance tickets and the parking and things. And they're very zealous about checking that they are getting every penny of it. But in spite of that, I'm glad to say we are in our 12th year now and it is sustainable. And uh, we've just concluded um, we have a monthly exhibition except during the monsoon for 10, 12 days. And we are averaging about two crores to three crores sales every month. So I for about a hundred craftspeople. Congratulations, that's incredible. Um, Anjana, your story is slightly different. You're the past national president of Fiki Flow, the CSR head of Somani Ceramics, and the founder director of Craft Stories Under the Mango Tree. Uh, you come from industry, but I know from your visits to artisans that you have a very keen eye for contemporary arts and crafts. Um, and the one thing as we started before um, um, opening up this discussion to um, the audience was we were congratulating you on your landmark exhibition for Serendipity Arts, which really was very brave in terms of positioning craft in the way in which you did yeah. at an art festival. So I want to ask you, how does a collaborative venture between corporates, galleries, 
design brands or design houses and <laughs> artisanal communities that you worked with. How did that work? So apart from the hats that you mentioned, I've been uh, connected with crafts for the past three decades. I'm also yes. founder member of Crafts Council Andhra Pradesh and been the past president of Delhi Crafts Council. So I've worked with crafts actively and I feel very passionately about it. So I just felt during my journey that uh, craft is a living tradition and that is something which was very important for us to know. We do celebrate our past skills but uh, we, I wanted to highlight the fact that what all is our living tradition. So the first exhibition I did in South Africa was <clears throat> the history section to set a context of what really the topic is. And then it had to be connected to a living tradition. And then that was an extravaganza of that said topic of whatever the living traditions offered. And they would be multifaceted, like different streams, different um, skills. And so I carried on and I did several exhibitions and three international exhibitions after that. And then, <clears throat> and a few in India, they had to be researched. The historical section and living tradition became a connecting thread in my exhibitions. So when I was invited to be the curator at Serendipity, so your, your question that how does this work when you are in synergy with corporates? <clears throat> it was an amazing experience because they give you complete freedom and they allow you to do what you would like to do. They give you a team, build the infrastructure, and uh, but they are they have a tight control on you know their budgets and everything which they handle themselves. And uh, but the idea we present a few ideas, but my idea was as serendipity was out of the box. What I wanted to highlight was <clears throat> that crafts is not homogeneous. And it is not restricted to one discipline. It is interdisciplinary. So they are connected with many streams, with many ideas. So I used a very out-of-box idea and I took architecture as my thread to do my exhibition. And so there are seven elements of space making. So it was the space making elements. I just took that as a thread. So as a small example, and roofs is one of the space making elements. There I explored materials terracotta, bamboo, and thatches. Through stairs, windows, and doors, I did woodcraft skills and connected it to how Indian artisan for 2,000 years is thinking in wood and carving in stone. And Saatchi is a living example of it. So I wanted to say that for 2,000 years, this parampara has continued and our artisanal skills have, are very honed in in woodcraft. So I showed five or six different woodcraft skills. And the Khatamban, the Vinjrakari from Kashmir, and... Um, Tarkashi and carving and marquetry from Mysore, like that. And then when we come to pillars, we are showing wall finishes. So it was just thought of in a very different way. And then we did the wall embellishments. So we did Araish and the Chetinat plaster and the Kerala uh, mural with the Shekhavati wall painting. And they were all products. They were all beautiful art objects. And in flooring, again, we did the Atanguri and we did the sustainability was a very important uh, thread in the entire exhibition. And so we did terrazzo because it uses uh, waste material. And then we had a whole section on sustainability where we used agri-waste to do craft practices. So they were uh, that was really a huge success. And uh, people just loved it because it was done like in a theater setting where the, the audience interacted and entered and understood. And uh, people understood that uh, So we had products which was small, not that somebody has to build a house, we have to go there. So it was done in a very composite manner and uh, it, it was received extremely well. And this year, I my thread is uh, crafts in the performing arts. And I'm quite excited about it because it's uh, shaping up well. And But what I really enjoy with the courtrets, to answer your question, that the festivals like this are very important because you yeah. need to have patronage and support because in the past crafts have survived because of patronage mm -hmm. and if corporates don't give patronage to the arts it's a festival which is free for everybody to enter so it is more educating the public and breaking the myth that craft is not just maybe a souvenir or something very decorated so many things lent to the craft practices. There are so many aspects and facets to it. 
So that was really yes. the aim. Yes, thank you so much, Anjana, for giving us that overview. And when do we look forward to this year's Surrender Pity? 15th to 23rd December. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Very interesting theme as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this was meant to be a, an introduction for all of us to learn about policies and ecosystems that have uh, really been foundational or not to the practices. Many of you have kind of taken on the route of self-sustainability too. Um, so moving to uh, today and the future, um, the world has changed quite quickly after the pandemic, as we all recognize. Artisans in particular are selling online direct to customers and markets. And uh, while that was a rapid change post pandemic, the other thing I think that was really interesting was the worldwide sort of rallying cry for the future is handmade. Uh, some very, very um, influential people um, said that, you know, we need, we need craft to signal hope for the future. Uh, Lee Edelcourt uh, first came up with this word that the future is handmade. And since then, as you know, she's had these, uh, instead of the economic world, the World Economic Forum, she's had World Hope Forums, as you know. So, Craft is emerging as a global answer to all our shared concerns for climate change. Um, and uh, in this regard, I'd like to quote Dr. Ashok Chatterjee, who's for many years been a mentor to the craft uh, sector, um, first as um, director, executive director of NID and also shepherding the Crafts Council of India for the last 20 years. And he says that given the rising demand for ethically produced, locally made products, craft as an industry has the lowest carbon footprint of any major industry. It has the potential to meet the future needs of sustainable production and consumption. And uh, as we know, one of the sustainable development goals is responsible production and responsible consumption, two sides of the same coin as to how we can give meaningful work, care for the well-being of the artisan, the producers, and how we as consumers can take it upon us to be more conscious consumers. So I'd like to talk about... Um, policy initiatives um, that you have worked quite closely and um, also the question of uh, policy reaching, you know, that last mile reaching the artisan and, and impacting them. So Jayaji, my first question is for you. Um, it concerns scale. And this major change that we're seeing in the in the industry today, I remember 10 years ago or 12 years ago, craft was very much deemed as a sunset industry. And if and we all remember the struggle between handloom versus the power loom lobby. And today, craft is much more mainstream than 12 years ago. Um, and it's also um, together with the wonderful introduction that Ritu gave us about the changes that the 1990s brought with the rise of private equity, foreign investment, corporate business interest in design and craft, um, this, this move towards the privatization of the sector, um, where a sector that was largely informal and unorganized is now being um, sort of taken into formal corporate business models where scale, mass manufacture, and the bottom line are the main measures of success. Um, and the question is, 
how does one change the way the private sector understands the craft sector um, very much to do with um, uh, a change in ethos, a, a change in how will the craft sector survive? Um, and what are the risks do you see in the corporate business models that are emerging for the craft economy? A related question is also how much scale is good scale? <laughs> And, I mean, and of course, do we need new policy initiatives, you know, to anticipate some of the changes that are going to be coming? I have two, two or three points to make on this whole idea of the corporate and even the word industry. I have always from day one been uncomfortable with the word cultural and creative industry. Because industry immediately takes you to industrialization, large production, um, rigid organizational structures. And all this is completely inimical to the craftsperson's world and methods of production. I think there is a much larger world that we need to deal with, which not only helps the craftsperson on the ground, but the planet as a whole. And immediately, I want to come to this whole idea of climate change, because I remember Ashok Chatterjee and I had a long discussion last year when I um, initiated an exhibition called Coalescence of Craft, Culture, Community, and Climate, and made the ICCR, in fact, sponsor an exhibition um, where I showed how many areas of craft, like art, craft, textile, recycle, aromatics, all these handmade are all part of sustainable in nature. All of them use natural materials. All of them don't spoil the environment. And I think India has a huge role. And I feel G20 missed this point that when they talk about climate change, they end up talking about who's going to fund it, but they don't, we should look into our own craft livelihoods and point out how Every single one of them uses either recycle, reuse natural materials, which they either wait for the climate to gen regenerate or they regenerate themselves. And I think the most, that's why this whole handmade is the future. It should add a little thing before saying handmade was the past and will be the future because everybody did this. And then we suddenly relegated them to the background when industrialization came all over the world. And now we're suddenly saying, oh, now we have to go back to that. But we don't leave the industrial processes or the industrial language. And I don't quite feel that, um, like, for instance, I don't mean to take a name, so I won't say, but there are certain business houses, international ones, which set up worksheds and get their products made in these worksheds by women who leave their homes, come there and work on their looms and go back. But I don't, I think we're breaking up the family culture in that. The passing on of skills, the sharing of skills, the understanding of each other, the husband works on the loom sometimes, the wife works on it other times, the child will fiddle with the spinning wheel at some times, the grandmother will too. I think these cultural sharings within communities is a wonderful gift that India has. And I think this becomes a part of promotion of how we sustain the climate through craft livelihoods. So the livelihood and the skills and the processes are what we have to help. So when we talk about that, we say natural dyeing. Natural dyeing, it's very difficult for craftspeople to now access it because forests go under forest acts or the business community take on some of the licenses for that. Many areas, they just work on scrap or wild grass or other such material, which is waste. Why can we not provide for them the priority of providing cultivation of raw material? Like our Khatri family in Buj, Kach, they produce their own indigo as much as possible, more as expected. <laughs> but these are things we should facilitate every community that has an ancient and present knowledge of natural dyeing to revive. So our forests have to get involved. Our cultivation, our agriculture has to get involved. So we need to think very much wider in terms of policy. 
And the other thing I'd like to say is that we should talk about skill and not product. Because product means marketing, design, it all gets focused on online or markets or bazaars or hearts. But a skill is something that is usable in across all kinds of areas. Skill can be used for ag- um, architecture, as Anjana has shown. Skill can be used in so many different ways, right from uh, graphic design to book illustration, right to building materials and building uh, things which we did earlier. So we need to think big. All public spaces, for instance, must have a much bigger component of handmade, the comp- like park benches, airports, railway stations, bus stations, schools, the kind of uh, aesthetic decoration that we have, uh, embellishment we had earlier, is completely knocked off by, sorry to say, the bizarre multicolored stuff that went on in the recent G20 to jazz up everything. It was just completely against the Indian aesthetic. Mm-hmm. And I wish that we would follow the craft um, instinct in embellishment other than the craftsman ending up doing kitsch stuff because he thinks that's what sells. So there are many areas of policy and design where we have to refocus and redirect the policy and forget about these old things like trade fairs, bazaars. Yes, yes, they have to go on. But we have to think larger because that's the way we will make a point in the, on the national scene. And you know, otherwise we keep wallowing in the same old stories. Uh, whether it's the first industrial policy or even now. So the more other ministries join in, the better, but it therefore has to be a much, much wider vision that influences policy. Thank you. And uh, that actually brings me to, um, you know, thank you for reminding us that we're one of the few countries that has such a diversity of skill. Um, And I had a question regarding that. So I'm going to jump a couple of questions and go directly to that. Um, The next generation of the artisan and the passing on of that skill. Anjana, I'd like to direct it to you. Um, You know, when I started artisans in 2011, one master artisan in Kutch said to me, the next generation of my family doesn't want to get their collars dirty. They all want white collar jobs. And um, since then, we've seen what um, Kalaraksha and Sumaya Kalavidya have brought to the table, which represents an excellent educational model that was designed with many of you and others um, by Judy Freiter. And Suma Kalavidya's curricula gives agency to the artisan, not just as a producer of someone else's vision, but as a designer and through market awareness as an entrepreneur. And I was just, you know, in continuation to what Jayaji just said, um, what do you think is critical to bringing back young artisans to craft, even bringing in non-hereditary students? Um, can we create recognitions like the, you know, beyond the master craftsman, such as could we create a degree, a sort of recognized level of skill, or can we create pathways to 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 make craft a respected career choice that begins at the school level. Um, You know, I remember when design was such a young profession, could craft become a respectable profession in and of itself outside and across craft cast lines, Anjana? Uh, I was wondering what, what, how you could address that future of uh, initiatives like Sumaya Kalavidya. So you've asked me a couple of questions, Radhi. So I think, uh, firstly, I feel that craft has to be design-driven. If it's not design-driven, it can die a natural death. And what Sumaya Kalavitya is doing is that they have an art- the school for artisans to become design students so that they understand the basics. And the other thing is that the 
earlier there were chopas and hearts which offered the markets to the artisans and they knew their neighbors they knew what the neighbors wanted but now with the urban market opening up and the scale going up for you know a compulsion of running a family etc they need to know their urban market also so design is very important because if they are not uh, going to be conversant with that aspect they are not going to know what they are going to be able to sell so that kind of exposure is important and then you you asked me if uh, about uh, creating respectable career choices craft as a profession so it i think it boils down to bread on the table in the evening because if they are going to make a career choice it has to be something that supports the family so if we just make it very esoteric by saying that you know that's a career choice it's so noble it's so good is not going to go down i in bhuj i do a lot of work in bhuj and i can see that people who are engineers and who are very they have all come back to their parampara because that is what is getting them more money so it's a thriving i mean that's a classic example and if we can have something like that in every part of the world because i think that the design school has been an important part there and that's the reason they are all coming back to there because they are able they are able to sell and they do have a spirit of entrepreneurship in gujarat and then you asked me about how the school whether it should be initiated in schools definitely it should be people should understand that you know it is okay we think that craft is uh, a disorganized sector it's informal but it's not disorganized there is a system in place which we don't understand and we think it is disorganized but i believe that it's not really like that it is self sustainable the artisan is able to work at his own leisure and it it offers an alternate income so craft they will always dip into i feel we just have to create an ecosystem where the artisan you know like what uh laila is doing to offer the markets and what jaya does so and the, jaya i remember jaya being very design driven in the beginning when i first saw her uh, products i think that um, i would say that she was really for small products one of the f- first few people who had some design driven products and to just offer the markets and offer a platform that there is an alternate application if it's if we don't have a product diversification we cannot be purists that okay a worldly painting is supposed to be on a mud wall of a hut where are we going to have those huts we have to give them a canvas so we we have to get out of that zone that we are we work in the craft sector and we have to be purists mm-hmm. so if they have many applications for the survival the skill set to survive is more important than the the history of the craft and the pristineness of you know how it was applied earlier mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it can be both it can be crafts are for everyday use and the very high skilled practices which has made india famous in history mm-hmm. so we can make craft yes so we can yes. like have both coexist in india today yes yes so you mentioned something very important which was at the end of the day it's about bread on the table and uh, you know the the grim reality is that in our sector crafts people don't even get the guaranteed minimum daily wage that mn rega provides in their same area so my next question is for geeta geeta as 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 president of the crafts council of india and having just been through an emergency like the pandemic um uh, we we got a sense of the acute awareness of the vulnerability of artisans and the complete lack of social security for the crisis that afflict them this was the pandemic but floods famine war and insurgencies um we also learned that artisans have great pride and they don't want charity so how could we um you know what sort of steps could we currently take that would help support um rehabilitation in the wake of emergencies but also 
longer a uh, longer view social security that would give them um you know medical insurance i care children's education all of these things that a working person you know it's it's an it's at the moment a nice to have but how could we uh, give them that support system um yeah it's it's um we they do need medical insurance mm -hmm. uh, we've tried working at it but the um, premium can be huge because there's no point getting a medical insurance which doesn't cover anything so if if it's a family and they're looking at group insurance we're trying to work it out but the premiums are huge for 125 people the premium is like 25 lakhs mm -hmm. but that would entitle them to go up to 1 lakh of medical benefits i mean that, that's a good scheme but who's going to be able to afford that 25 lakhs so we're trying to work on that sort of thing but i do think medical insurance is very very important i do know that the government had some schemes earlier and there were a lot of all sorts of things going on the same person would apply in different names and you know mm. it just wasn't working out right so that yeah. probably the private sector needs to get into this and a lot of them are willing as part of csr to do this um as far as other things are concerned how do they survive we find that um if we are dealing with women give them giving them financial literacy uh digital empowerment goes a long way in making them realize that they too can do business you know they need not be dependent on a trader or somebody else that they can do a business together so they have after a few of these uh, courses that we have had suddenly a group of 40 women said okay now we formed four self help groups we've started our bank accounts now give us marketing so it it's not just that it needs a lot of hand holding you know you can't just kill them and move away because where do they go from there they need to be working at quality to be able to enter the market and eventually it's the market if we can help them find wider markets which we have to do there are so many levels of marketing and we have to ensure that they're aware of everything help them reach those markets thank you and speaking of women uh, leila my next question is to you um how can we improve the access to market for young women artisans you know i see so many talented women even collectives of women embroiderers but they're not able to leave their families their young families and go to the market um a, a related question is also that the next generation of of uh, artisans who are involved with domestic crafts like embroidery or quilting regarded very much within their own home as that craft which my illiterate grandmother does you know they don't um, think about it as something that they would take on and i know you recently been doing a lot of work uh with a series called her craft where you're working with 10 women artisans um supported by a wonderful grant so i'd love you to tell us a little bit about this initiative your learnings and what potential it 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 can help help uh show us for policy for women to reach market thank you radhi i think you've actually collated two different daskar projects uh, her story was actually in 2003 when the a to artisans gave us uh, a, a small grant for uh, working with five different groups of women from gujarat from bihar and from karnataka to make big wall hangings and tell their stories as part of it so that mm -hmm. project was then and it was very interesting because one of the things when when we did the workshops for this project it was so difficult to get women 
to think of themselves as the center of the story. They, you know, did scenes in their drawings and sketches initially. They did scenes of the village, they did scenes of the family, and they were usually one minuscule little figure in some corner and to try and make them the center of the thing. But anyway, that was now 20 years ago. I think the project which you're referring to was actually a COVID thing in the middle of the first COVID wave. We were approached by American Express That's who said right. that they wanted to assist Daskar to reach out to women artisans. And that was quite a substantial grant. It was just under one crore. And we worked with 67 different groups of women artisans all over India, encompassing, I think, about 12,000 women and uh, helping them with initially supplies, medical supplies and food supplies, but then gradually moving to raw material and so that they could build up stock for when COVID receded. And then with some sort of, I'm never very comfortable with this word design. I prefer product development or skill development. And so we did a series of initially online and then offline workshops to enhance their skills and then brought them to the market. And then in the next year, uh, American Express wanted to continue the project and we sort of did a little more focus where instead of the 67 groups, we worked with 12 groups who had shown the most, um, made the most successful use of the initial funding. And we worked with them and we had four designers who uh, traveled and worked on workshops and product development. And then we did a series of exhibitions and B2Bs with those designs. But actually our uh, discovery over 40 plus years of Daskar is that, you know, you show a woman, you open a door and they come surging out. Unlike male craftspeople who are often very conservative and who say that, oh, we've always done things in a certain way and we want women because it's a new thing for them. And I think women by their nature are used to adapting to new households, new husbands, new ways. We find them very, very receptive. And uh, they once, all of them, whether they're uh, sort of uh, reclusive Brahmins in Bihar or Pardad Bukhad women in Lucknow, they initially may say that, oh, we we'll work our fingers to the bone, but we won't go out to bazaars, we cannot travel and so on. You know, once you manage to tempt them out, uh, and say, this is the condition on which we work with you. Once they are there, then it's no problem to get them to come again and again. And then you see a very interesting development where they see that actually their craft brings them so much money that they start sending their most useful, useless son or nephew to the bazaar to sell, saying that we'd prefer to work at home. And so again, the cycle goes round. Uh, I think that Indian women are really the future of this country, and I have no hesitation of saying it to all you women. Uh, and uh, that it's very interesting also to see how many uh, initially male occupations are now being done by women in the craft sector. Uh, I mean, chicken curry itself, the finest work used to be done by men. Now there are very few men, chicken curry uh, craftspeople, and it's all women. Uh, in the jewelry industry, women have taken over Meena Kari and uh, go, even gold uh, jewelry making. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, of course, partly because the men have moved off. But it is also that women have realized that this is a home-based activity which they can do, which brings in money. I just want to end by saying that um, I think that, uh, I mean, I want to respond to something that Anjana said, and which, of course, I agree that it's bread on the table, which is the primary thing craftspeople today can't really afford to work for the love of art, and they work to earn. But I think much more than the wages that they get, it is the social status that we give craftspeople okay. that is preventing young craftspeople from entering the sector. And that is why 
Kutch and Kashmir are the two places where young people are coming into the sector and are ready to stay there and follow, because they are given a certain respect among the community. Otherwise, uh, you know, a Karigar is the most uh, undervalued kind of person. And while their products may be the pride of, uh, you know, society homes, they themselves are very seldom welcome there. And I think unless that situation changes and unless we work at that and emphasize that really a craftsperson is a skilled professional, he's not some sort of throwback to a primitive age. I think until that, we will have this drain from the craft sector. Um, Radhi, I'd like to add a little bit to that, if I may. Um, just interpreting again what Laila said, is um, the fact that um, social status means actually the respect that they get. And um, there's a lot of difference I found in the reaction from uh, Karigars who come from caste, more caste-based states like UP and Bihar. There the caste matters much longer because I've heard many a family say that our son working as a elevator boy or something in a mall is more important for us to get a bride for him than to say he's a weaver. But in other states, uh, many, many, I think Laila also will be a witness to this, that many, many young women, men come out, maybe the women have done the work, maybe the women are also their mothers and sons, wives and husbands, and they're equal partners today. And um, the men come and they model saris. Young UP boys in beards will model a sari to show how beautiful it is. And I think this kind of crossover is very exciting because you, you have admiring people and admiring customers. So you need that admiration and respect as well as you need the money. Yes for bringing that and the satisfaction of the work at um, the JSW award one of the uh, jury members Sanjeev reminded us that there is just that pure satisfaction of craft um, um, and the meditativeness of of being able to focus on creating um, I'm afraid that um we we've kind of we're running out of time, but we've all I'm looking at 31 questions in our chat box. And one of them, so we have a very engaged audience. Thank you so much to all of you who've tuned in. But one of them is very much what I was going to ask about next. Um, shifting the focus to the consumer and what my friend calls the power of the green purse. How do you, you know, um, really uh, um, through your own buying support uh, a sustainable lifestyle? So how could we collectively work on and with consumers, urban users to get them to appreciate crafts such as that they make a natural choice to buy and use handmade. So to that, I just wanted to add that, you know, we seem to be in the thick of a very consumerist society. Um, malls on Sundays are just like um, a fairgrounds. Um, and yet you have the young, the young people. Uh, my nephew this morning said, uh, you know, I would prefer to buy secondhand clothing and you actually get really interesting clothes when either you're passed down something that uh, within the home or you found it as a thrifter. So how we live and how we consume. Um, in India, where it's already very ingrained. Yes, Anjana. So uh, it's very interesting that according to an IBM study, the search for traceability for supply chains increased 71% in 2020 and uh, between 21 and 20. And the searches for ethical, sustainable products have increased by 40%. 
so this is a very big opportunity because young people want to buy something that is sustainable that's ethically made so that is something which was very interesting to see these figures so obviously the young consumer is definitely looking to buy ethical products so the craft has a good chance here i don't think there's a better time uh, worldwide for something like this uh, just looking at the sustainability sustainable development goals that india signed up for you know of the 17 11 address directly the craft economy and are influencing the consumers as climate change becomes so evident that we need to um buy and support things that are in opposition to fossil fuels polyester plastic um and all of that but how can we how can the sustainable development goals be incentivized or prioritized into policy is that something jaji that you are working with i think it automatically comes when you pro- promote the livelihoods of the craft sector uh, because so many of it as we've mentioned just now cover all of them i don't think you need to strongly focus because whether it's sustainability women education it all flows one into the other and um going a little back to what anjana was saying about how you promote and you mentioned malls um i think india has a huge opportunity now with the craft sector to show how unique each piece is as unique as each human being and therefore we should not go for standardized mass production you will get a nike shoe of the same kind in every mall all over the world but you will not get a particular scarf that was woven by a weaver in a particular village in kashmir anywhere else because there is a limit to the production and i think the beauty must be in that smaller limited editions the whole way of thinking of the industrial sector is something i think we should take the responsibility of changing non standardized non mass scale and non uh, you know packaged in expensive material the packaging of an atmosphere wrapping it in the local newspaper tying it with jute string all these things are part of the value values of sustainability so the, our promotion should be for that for climate for therefore ethical and uniqueness i think the main argument for all of us should be each of us here is unique why can't the products made by human beings hand also be unique be happy with what you have and that nobody else has it nobody quite wants what everybody has or they all go for it like sheep chasing something right right and i have to say that um you know that um you're also talking about making craft democratic and accessible uh in opposition to what a lot of the fashion industry began to talk about handmade as luxury it is in the west but i think here it need not be luxury you know we have the numbers that the global brands are looking for how can we leverage uh access uh to consumers for for affordable craft so that was no question that was a follow on comment um i'm just going to read out some of the audience questions um do you think that Radhi, the- i'd really like to just respond to what you said just now please can i just take 2 minutes please uh well first of all i think the big mistake that everybody including policy makers make and certainly exporters do is to think of craft as a generic thing mm. there's so many different kinds of crafts at different levels and they all have to be sold differently and promoted differently you can't sell a basket in the same way as you can do a wonderful piece of sculpture mm. and while i absolutely agree that you know the uniqueness of the craft process is its greatest strength and we must build on our strengths rather than our weaknesses i think we also have to recognize that not all craft can be sold in the same places in the same way mm. and that 
whether it's our bazaars or whether it's our craft emporiums or our lifestyle stores cannot contain the huge wealth and diversity of Indian craft. Mm. So there must be places for functional crafts, for basketry, for brooms, for things like that. And we have to have galleries and places where wonderful art. I mean, I don't think that folk art need to be sold on the pavements of our uh, metro cities. They should be properly uh, mounted and displayed and sold and given their value. Mm. I would actually like to also reclaim this word industry because I think nothing describes the craft process better than the extraordinary industry that goes into it, much more so than turning out Nike shoes on an assembly line at the rate of, you know, one pair a second. And it's one of the reasons why I think that all of us, uh, even though it seems a rather old fashioned way of marketing, still have craft demonstrations and crafts workshops at our events, because the young have to see what goes into the process. It's idealistic to think that they're going to travel to the village and watch it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they can actually see it and understand what goes into making a pot or making a, a piece of, uh, you know, even a very basic product, I think their understanding and their acceptance and in, uh, would increase and instead of bargaining and thinking it's their cultural right to beat down the price of a handmade article, they might actually understand that it's worth paying for. Absolutely. And uh, that has so much to do with creating value also when you when you experience in a in a workshop yeah, making yeah. that object, you begin to value both the skill and the time. Um, we have a wonderful question from Urvashi Bhati. I'm a designer working in hard materials of Indian traditional handicrafts. Uh, can you please elaborate on the intellectual property of traditional handicrafts when it's lineage versus new development? Who does the IP belong to? What's ethical when uh, designers, researchers, et cetera, add to these traditional crafts, colors, finishes, textures? Um, after all, um, these lineages would not have been possible had the craftspeople also not shared their knowledge. So the idea of intellectual property, which I, I did want to discuss, um, particularly when we see it in contrast to the high level of protections that, say, Australia gives its indigenous arts. Um, um, to what she's talking about, which is adaptation and change, who would like to take that question? I think we'd all like to, but we really need Ritu Sethi here to tell us a little bit about what's going on in GI. That was my first thought. Uh, but a quick comment I'd like to make is yes. that in a way, it's a whole new development for the cultural world of the craftsperson. The community of craft does not demand possession. It, it shares and everybody's part of it. You can't hide something you're making in a village from your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the neighbor comes and helps. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's very sad um, when this development takes place that the designer so-called claims uh, ownership of that product. But what can be the middle way, which is happening to some extent now, is that they do share the name. But the label of any one designer doesn't ever really have the name of anything else. The sari is still Sambalpuri or uh, UP Jamdani or something. But the designer's name is not there, whereas the designer might have just picked up some old design and rearranged and refashioned its colors or something. So uh, I think there has to be more conscience among the businessman, entrepreneur, designer to share uh, acknowledgement and share the, the royalty, you can say, or even a share of the main work which has been spent on the whole thing. And but that's again a question of us, I think, uh, all of us uh, 
sort of encouraging and inculcating this idea that the craft itself, the person, the maker is very important. Mm -hmm. It's not just a passive pair of hands that follows an instruction. I saw a comment here of say asking me why I felt uncomfortable about the word design. I only do it because it's acquired a connotation which is not which is of a person coming, a, a professional designer coming from the city and using the craftsperson to realize something that is in the designer's head. It actually is and should be a partnership of both. And the craftsperson has as much input and value in the process as this designer. And until we manage to pass that around, and make people, including the designers themselves, understand that they are one cog in the process. There's centuries of tradition and skill and technique, which they are optimizing to make something which is in their imagination. And they must have the craftsperson as a very active partner in this process. And that's why so many so-called design uh, schemes and design uh, collections really flop, particularly in three-dimensional craft, in hard materials, because the designer doesn't really understand and very often doesn't even ask the relevant questions of the craftspeople with whom they're working. Yes. I would say that in, when you ask about IP, I feel that, of course, you have to hand back stewardship, stewardship of the tradition to the designer, to the, to the artisan. He must have the stewardship of that. And now it's all right to say, is the IP all right or not? But how do you educate the, the consumer, mm. whether it's ethical or not? And which the, I think we have to pick and choose which designer, which design person, which design house works with ethical practices, borrows from traditional knowledge, works along with the artisans. I think it's important to declare that, uh, so you choose the people, you choose the person. If you're conscious of it, you choose like that. There is no IP. Everything is there on the internet. If anybody wants to copy, if you have, uh, your design has been registered, then it's an IP. So then you fight your battle on that front. But you cannot make an IP on a craft tradition or a skill set. So nobody can, nobody's doing that. They're doing on the interpretation or the reinterpretation of the design. And that design has got a co-creation. It's not just that one item. They put some paint on it. They put some wood. They have added things. So in any case, the artisan can't do it because he's doing what he does best. But to co-create with other streams and other kinds of materials is not his strength. So the designer has done that. That's his job. And he... Some of, the some of the many of the artisans are quite proud of their uh, innate skills, and I don't think a designer can really get through to them unless they are in agreement mm. with what is in plan, what has been planned for that product. So That's you know they have to. The designer can't work unless the community wants them there and wants to do something with the designer. So they they're quite. Uh, intelligent and they know how to protect themselves. And I think this idea of a more equitable relationship is being encouraged. The idea of co-creation where you understand each other's roles and, and uh, respect where each other are, are coming from. So with that, we reached eight o'clock. Um, very unfortunately, I feel as if we need a part two to this conversation because there are still questions coming in and um, each of which are really important. Uh, but given that you've had four decades in the industry, I just wanted to end with this, with you having the last word. If you, I'm sorry, I'm doing something that a lot of these popular TV shows too. But if you had to choose one policy you would advocate that would sustain craft in the future, what would that top priority for you be? Who are you addressing? <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> Each of you. Okay. So, well, let me throw my hat into the ring. Yeah. Uh, we've had this as Ritu Sethi reminded us, we've had a plethora of 
new initiatives and new promises being made for the craft sector. And I think we all are very happy and we're looking to see how it goes. But I must say that I feel that we cannot make craft universally available and also economically viable for the makers unless we do something about raw material. I think that uh, I recently went to the Delhi Crafts Council Sari exhibition mm -hmm. and it was staggering to see how the increase in the price of silk has really made exquisite saris only really accessible to the very creamy layer of Indian society. And that's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And especially when we know that it's not that the weaver is really getting much more money than he was getting last year. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to encourage, I mean, after all, uh, Andhra and Karnataka used to have these fields of cotton, which have now been turned to tobacco and God knows what. Mm -hmm. There's urbanization going everywhere where the forest is receding. Mm -hmm. uh, lakes and ponds no longer have uh, grow grasses and fibers around them for basketry. Mm -hmm. uh, wood and metal have become, again, so, so exorbitantly expensive. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be, along with schemes to encourage craftsmanship, and to encourage craftspeople to continue. We have to have parallel encouragement for, for the agricultural sector to cultivate things which can be used by the craft sector. So that's really my wish. Plus, I wish that the government would cease to be a, a person in the thing. The government must be a catalyst it should not actually run craft emporiums, craft schemes, do whatever. I mean, because sometimes the results are so disastrous. Well, in my view, we yeah. need a census. We need? We need a census. We don't know how many artisans we have. How many of them are really, for, for example, a handloom worker gets a certain amount of yarn but half of them are fictitious. So we must know who our handloom workers are. So whatever schemes that are going, they should go to the right place. So we need a census. Yes. And we have a sketchy kind of a census. So I think that that's very, very critical to the craft sector. Yes. And I think that that probably will be something for a future discussion because I believe, Gita, that uh, there is there are some policies regarding capturing the number of people who are engaged in the craft sector. Uh, you're developing a methodology around that. But since we've run out of time, um, just uh, uh, Jayaji and Geeta, what would your top priority be? I think I gave an overall idea of what policy should focus on. And yes. I think all of those would be. One is uh, de-standardization, de-industrialization in an overall framework. And yes. two is supporting anything, which adds to what Laila was saying about agriculture, anything that supports the livelihood, that supports the planet, that does not cause degeneration of the planet. So both these things will give us a, a not only livelihood enhancement, but as well as a kind of standing that makes India show the world how important the craft sector is. And I think now that we're all trying to push India onto the world stage in so many things, it's time for crafts to take its place on that stage. I think, if I may add, I think the uh, access to finance is very important. Mm. Laila did mention raw material, but most often to get the best raw material, you have it to have to buy it in bulk. And the artisans are not able to do that. So they must have access to finance. Mm. So that and is the Vishwakarma scheme, which is yeah. how much access they do important. get. Implementation is the key. Yes. May I uh, suggest that uh, the next, if, if the Asia Society may grant us, you know, a following uh, second um, discussion, 
Um, it would be wonderful to talk about Vishwakarma and to discuss that and how Vishwakarma can really reach the artisan that 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 the policy is meant for. And also a little bit about the data collection methodology that Geeta, you're developing. But thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an absolute honor and an absolute pleasure to talk to each one of you. Um, we've been very blessed with a very, very engaged uh, audience. And there are so many questions. I was just wondering, Tarini, if we may record these questions and if we may circulate these questions, because I think each of these is a little discussion in and of itself. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I've already gotten seven minutes over, but thank you all so much. Jaji, especially wishing you a, a quick healing so that you're back with the strength in your hands to push the next bit of work. And Anjana, Leila, Gita, lovely to see you all and look forward to seeing you in person, I hope, before long. Thank yes, you. Indeed. And, and thank you for being a wonderful you. moderator, lovely questions, yes, and yes. Uh, gave us all time to turn our thoughts and share them. Yes, thank really you. Well and thank you, Asia Society, for making it happen. Yes, thank, thank you, Asia thank Society, you. for making it happen. And for those hours and hours of discussion uh, and all the investment that um, you made in making this uh, the, the session it's been. Thank you so much, each and every one of your team. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.